welcome to this event on the impact of climate crisis on Mediterranean cities and how this can be mitigated, organised by Heinrich Boll Stiftung. My name is Kira Taylor, I'm an energy and environment journalist based in Brussels, and I'll be moderating our conversation today as we look at how cities can adapt and learn from each other as the climate crisis worsens. The aim of today is to share perspectives on the impact of climate change and the foreseen trends for our cities. We'll hear from four speakers from across the Mediterranean about the impacts that they're seeing and what strategies and tools can be used to ensure sustainable living for citizens. During this, you can activate captions at the base of the screen, and this event will also be recorded so you can watch it back again later. During this, we'll also have time for a short Q&A. You can join in with this by submitting your questions to our speakers by using the Q&A function on Zoom. Please don't put it on the chat function, please put it on the Q&A function, otherwise I won't be able to see it. Please also indicate the person to whom your question is addressed. Now, the impacts of the climate crisis are ever more tangible in Europe, particularly in the Mediterranean. In recent years, the area has seen drastic heat waves, droughts and forest fires. Already this year, the Mediterranean saw a record breaking heat wave in April, with scientists saying this was far more likely because of climate change. And as global temperatures rise, these erratic weather patterns are going to become much more frequent. This could have a very tangible impact on European cities and their citizens. Because of this, Europe not only has to look at reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, but also to adapting to an ever-changing climate. This is a particular challenge for cities. There are ways that cities can adapt to climate change, for instance, by using trees to reduce street temperatures, by putting water fountains in public areas and renovating buildings to keep them cool. But there are major challenges in rolling these measures out. We'll hear more about that throughout our session today. But first, to introduce Heinrich Boll Stiftung and talk about the importance of today's topic, I'd like to bring in Mikolas Gudis. Mikolas, to introduce us to the topic, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Kira. And I would like to indeed welcome you all on behalf of the Heinrich Boll Stiftung offices of Paris, Brussels, and Thessaloniki. Um, we joined forces for this event for other obvious reasons. As you said, uh, we have all experienced the impact of the climate crisis in the Mediterranean lately in form of droughts, uh, wildfires, floods, and so on. Mediterranean indeed won't be uh, confronted with the multifaceted impacts of the climate crisis in the future. It is here and now confronted with them. And uh, this is also, uh, this is and will be essentially the main challenge of uh, for our cities and not only for the urban, but also for the rural areas of this part of Europe for the years to come. And today we're focusing, of course, on the Mediterranean cities uh, to shed light to questions, as you said, uh, how prepared are they? What measures, practical measures are they implementing? How can they be supported at the European level? And how can they support and exchange uh, with each other? We really think that these questions should be also integral parts of the electoral campaigns at all levels and the, the pre-electoral discussions, for example, in Greece, We'll be having local and regional elections in October, but really nobody seems to be speaking uh, in uh, the public debate about these uh, issues. And also, uh, we shouldn't be uh, forgetting that in less than a year time now, the European elections will be taking place. And of course, these issues should definitely be part of uh, the agenda there. So I'm really looking forward also from our side, uh, the organizer side, to listening to our speakers and to receiving uh, questions and comments from our audience. Uh, warm thanks uh, to all four uh, speakers uh, for joining us uh, today. To you, of course, Kira, for uh, moderating, to our colleagues from Sociality for the tech support, and also to our colleagues from Paris and Brussels for uh, the excellent collaboration and organization of this event. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, to dig deeper into this topic, we're joined, as you say, by four speakers who are working in this area. They are Claudia Di Napoli, a scientist at the Forecast Department at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, Elizabeth Bargliani, Chief Heat Officer for the City of Athens, Marco Falcone, a researcher at the Itali Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and Research, and Felix Blanc, Project Manager for the Ecological Transition Department at the City of Marseille. Thank you all for joining us. After we've heard from each of you, we will go on to our question and answers. So for our audience, please start thinking up those questions and putting them into the Q&A throughout the interventions. 
But first, Claudia, that's come to you. So you're working as a scientist on uh, medium range weather forecasts. What impact have you seen climate change have on heat in the recent decades and how does this impact cities? Hi, Kira. Hi, everybody. Um, so yes, in my presentation, I will be exactly addressing this topic. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Kira, can you kindly confirm that everything is looking as is good? OK. We can see it. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks a lot. So yes. Um, Thanks, Michalis, for the invitation to this great event. It's really a pleasure to be with you all today. So responding to Kira's question, yes, in my presentation, I will be talking about heat, how climate change has been affecting heat in recent decades, and what tools we have to predict heat so that mitigation actions can be taken. And I will do that by taking you on a journey that starts at the European level, and then I will zoom in at the city scale. Some of the material you see today was provided by Birgit Suetz, a colleague of mine at CNWF, and to whom I'd like to extend my thank you for her help. So before starting, I would like to offer an overview of what ECNWF is for those not familiar with it. ECNWF stands for European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts and is an intergovernmental organization supported by 34 member and cooperating states. ECMWF has been a leading center for operational weather forecasts for the last 50 years and is a key player in the Copernicus program, which offers quality assured information on climate change. And on this slide, as you can see, I have highlighted two expressions, weather predictions and climate change. And this is not by chance. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I will be talking about heat exactly from these two points of view. So first of all, why heat? Well, the answer is simple. Heat poses a threat to human health, and it does so in the form of heat stress, which is the buildup of heat in our body due to factors such as air temperature, humidity, ventilation, radiation. I think we all know the difference between being in full shade or in full sunlight during a summer day. Now, it is well established that heat stress causes a variety of health problems, such as dehydration, loss of productivity among the exposed populations. When a heat wave happens, groups such as the elderly or people with previous medical conditions, such as cardiovascular diseases, are the most affected by heat stress. And that's essentially because their bodies cannot cope in that environment, in the stagnant conditions of no wind and usually high temperature, but then day and night. So what are the consequences of this? That when there is a heat stress and this reaches high levels, more people go to the hospital, more people go to their family medical doctors. And for those more fragile, extreme heat stress can even mean death. So ICMWF we produce a heat stress information, and we do that by means of historical of past climate data. Specifically, we use the climate data on air temperature, humidity, wind, and insulation to calculate the states of the art indices, such as the Universal Thermal Climate Index, UTCI in short. The UTCI describes the, exactly the heat stress our body undergoes by considering its physiology, so how the body works, and the clothes even that we wear. And the heat stress information provided by climate data, past the climate data via the UTCI is freely available on the Copernicus Climate Data Store. It covers the period from 1940 to almost the present, so a very long period. A period that is long enough to understand how heat stress has changed, has been changing until now. UTCI data are in fact used in the European State of the Climate, an annual report compiled by the Copernicus Climate Change Service, which is implemented by CMWF on behalf of the European Commission. And the report has an entire session on heat stress. 
This section has some interesting graphs, among which there is this one I show on the right. It's the percentage of days from 1950 to 2022 with no thermal stress on the top and with very strong heat stress on the bottom during the summer season in Southern Europe. So no heat stress means that our body is able to keep thermal comfort without particular problems. Very strong heat stress means instead that our body must take actions such as reduce any physical activity and seek shade in order to avoid heat-related latencies like stroke, which can be fatal. In 2022, Southern Europe experienced a record number of days with very strong heat stress. And this is consistent with an upward trend in the frequency of heat occurrences, at the same time with a decrease in trend in the number of days with no heat stress. So what these two graphs on the right are telling us is that those living in Southern Europe have been experiencing more and more frequent conditions in which heat stress gets so high and regular during summer to be potentially detrimental to human health. These trends remain still valid if we focus from Central Europe now better on the Mediterranean. Here you can see a snapshot of the number of days in which heat stress reached high levels in 2020. The orange color is telling us that this number is around 40 days. So if we consider that a summer season has 92 days, this means that heat stress affects our lives in almost half of the summer season. Of course, there are geographical variations across the Mediterranean. This can be revealed if we continue zooming in down to the regional scale. So inspired by where the other speakers of this great event are from, I show on the right the number of heat stress days in the Provence, Alpes, Côte d'Azur and Attica, which are the regions where Marseille and Athens are located. And I think, although you know the numbers are different, but the upward trends are there and are clearly visible in both cases. Now, is this the whole story? No, because if we continue travel now reaching at the urban scale, we bump into the urban heat island effects, which worsen heat stress even further. This is because cities are full with pavements, buildings, and other surfaces that absorb, retain, and even emit heat. And this, of course, um, increases energy costs, such as for air conditioning, air pollution levels, as well as illnesses related to, uh, to heat stress. The urban heat island effect cannot be ignored, especially in Europe where 40% of the population lives in city, and this number even increases to 60% in the Mediterranean, according to some sources. Here is where the challenge comes from those like me the, and my colleagues that work on heat stress, its trends to date, and its forecasts. Cities or the urban environment, so to say, are usually not considered in weather prediction models or the historical reconstruction of the climate. And the reason for that is that the models that we use to do this prediction, to do this reconstruction, usually have a, a coarse spatial resolution. So we are talking about 90 to 31 kilometers, to give you an idea. So they are not able to really see the spatial distribution of urban areas, even or what's happening within the urban, the urban areas. But this is, however, changing. It's changing for good because the models we use are achieving higher and higher spatial resolution, as well as incorporating high definition data from satellites. And because of this, the weather effects specific to urban areas can now be represented and forecasted. In fact, we have designed and implemented a scheme which considers the cities at the interface between the soil and the atmosphere. And these schemes include urban canyons, which basically are bordered by road bases and roof fractions at either sides. The scheme will be operational in our forecasting system next year, 2024, and will be included also in the next generation of historical climate data, such as ERA-6. 
But we are not stopping here. Okay, research is ongoing to include the urban schemes in even final resolution for recasting models such as those planned for destination health. Um, for those who don't know, destination health is an ambitious, ambitious initiative of the European Union, an initiative of which ECMWF is part of. And the aim of destination earth is to create what we call a digital twin. So a digital twin is basically a computer simulation of our planet where we can play with each component of the planet. So the, uh, the, the atmosphere of the earth, the ocean, land, cities, and so on. And this is important because uh, thanks to this interactivity, it's like a game, we can revisit the past, under, understand the present, and predict the future of our cities. As part of the destination earth, for instance, ECNWF is contributing to the World Meteorological Organization's Research Demonstration Project, RDP, for the Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. And the aim of this project is to produce weather forecast of very high resolution. We are ta I'm talking about like 100 meters and doing this within Paris. So why this aim? Well, the Olympic sites will be located both in the vicinity of Paris and inside Paris. And uh, the inner part is one of the most dense in the world in terms of a building concentration. And that makes the prediction very challenging, especially when you have such an important international event happening. So these plots show an experimental 22 hour temperature forecast for, um, for Paris a resolution of around four kilometers. Currently, it's nine kilometers, so half of what we have now, now during the heat wave of June 2022. So on the left, the, scheme, the urban scheme I told you about is not included in the forecast. On the right, the urban scheme is included. And what you can immediately see is that with the urban skin, so on the right, temperatures are predicted to be much more elevated. And that's because urban effects are taken into account. So I know that this presentation about Mediterranean area in Paris is outside, but uh, this is an encouraging result, I think, and uh, a result on which we will keep on working the months to come with potential extension to other European cities located more south too. So this is for my presentation and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, a really useful overview both of what heat stress can do, of how cities are vulnerable to it, and also what may be done in the future to really help us monitor it. I think that Paris example is going to be really interesting, so we'll allow it for not quite being in the Mediterranean. Uh, thank you for that, Claudia. And next we'll hear from Elizabeth Bargiani, Chief Heat Officer for the City of Athens. So Elizabeth, how is Athens approaching this topic? Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for inviting me and giving the opportunity for the city of Athens to say uh, what we've been doing and uh, how we deal with heat. We are one of the most uh, vulnerable cities in the Mediterranean regarding heat. And there's been coordinated action from uh, our side regarding uh, heat combat. We are the first city that has assigned um, the uh, uh, the the first city in Europe that has assigned a chief heat officer through the Astrock Resilient Center. Uh, there are about eight in, in the globe, so that's really important and has elevated action in our city. And I would like to share a, a small presentation. Say what we've been doing. Can you see the presentation? We can. Yes. Oh, great. That's good. That's good. Uh, okay, so, well, um, I would like to say that uh, before I start uh, sharing what we do in the city of Athens, uh, I'm, I was very, very interested to what Claudia um, said about uh, heat waves and the research they're doing about heat. So I do think it's a, it's a field of uh, great cooperation between the city of Athens and probably uh, your organization since um, 
um, especially the last effort that you're doing for Paris and seeing the important effect on uh, that takes into, into account the urban heat island effect and uh, the projections without the urban heat island effect is amazing. You know, it, well, it's, it's scary. So um, here you see that not, not only the Mediterranean, but extremely uh, a lot in the Mediterranean area, we have a, a huge, um, uh, Euro European cities are affected more and more and more uh, from heat waves, but also from other phenomena such as flooding. Um, I'm giving this uh, small view of last summer's terrible heat wave that hit Europe and caused a lot of wildfires in the surrounding area of Athens, not the city of Athens. And, uh, you know, that lots of, lots of uh, thousands of hectares uh, of woodland was lost in the city, in, in the metropolitan area. Uh, although forest has not been lost in the city, it did affect a lot uh, the, the environment of our city, uh, the economy of the city, the health of our citizens. So it's very important to take uh, actions regarding heat and have coordinated actions in our city. So basically, uh, by issuing a climate action plan last year, a year ago from today, um, part of that, it's very heat related a climate action plan and uh, including the, uh, some heat resilient strategies in that. First of all, it has to do with the awareness. The other pylon has to do with the, the preparedness of the people of the city of Athens. And the second and the most difficult one is the redesign of a very densely built and very densely populated city such as Athens. So if you go to the awareness, we've been uh, working very hard with uh, science from the uh, Arthrock Resilience Center and METEO and the National Observatory of Athens. Uh, and we did the classification regarding the, oops, uh, the city of Athens on the, on the heat wave. So we, ex we followed the example of Seville, which uh, launched a similar program about naming and ranking heat waves. Um, the Athens program is being carried out in the collaboration with the Arthrock Resilience Center and the METEO. Uh, dot gr and uh, here uh, you see the sign uh, uh, the triangle that we have four categories of heat waves so um, last year there were on the site of the meteo and in the city's website to have some alerts regarding and informing citizens uh, about the category and the uh, uh, that the heat wave that will hit Athens will have. This is a um, categorization that relates uh, directly to the health impact to the citizens and um, what the consequences would be. So this summer, uh, we are uh, trying to put this, uh, we this will be put more prominently into our web page and, uh, uh, and we'll also expand the program in other in other four cities for uh, for Greece, so more cities in the, in Greece have will be following our examples regarding the heat awareness, let's say, and that'd be great uh, for the protection of citizens. The other thing that we do is prepare the citizens. Um, we we created a lot of information material, some funds for our citizens, but also we have uh, established. Uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, material, give some guided, uh, some guidance on how people could survive the heat wave and what sh people should be doing uh, when, the uh, when the heat wave comes. Um, this, uh, if you go to our website on coolathens.gr, you will get a lot of information uh, regarding that. And also the other thing has to do with more technical work, more uh, laborious work uh, that takes time to evolve and uh, be apparent in the city. And some of it is all already apparent and it has to do with the redesigning of the city we will see later. Uh, on the awareness side, 
uh, we are using uh, the Extreme app that we are quite proud that we created it. You know, we were uh, one of the partners who started um, working on this uh, application. Uh, where you find uh, your personalized health uh, risk uh, and the nearest cooling, cooling space. Other cities in Europe uh, use it as well. We've also created an intra-urban heat map um, collaborating with this uh, company. And also uh, we have an air quality add-on that also gives, gives information on the air quality of the city. Lately, we've added the uh, an application that has to do with people choosing cool routes in order to educate uh, children and visitors about the coolest route and uh, also with cool stops on drinking points or cool centers for the city of Athens. Um, this is co-managed. This is very important because there is a city dashboard that we put as a city information in there, where we have our pool centers for people to protect, where are the, the parks, um, uh, where are the uh, places that uh, uh, animals and stray animals uh, could drink water. So there are a lot of features that you have. please go on uh, Extrema uh, Global app and download it and have a look. So we did talk about the ranking of the heat waves. Um, I would like also to say that there is a special help hotline since last year, uh, where uh, we give, uh, with collaboration with, the international, with an international Red Cross, we give information to citizens in, in, uh, in case they need it. Uh, we did talk about the, uh, the application of Extrema. But also what we haven't talked about is greening our cities. You know, what we do in terms of redesigning a very difficult city like Athens. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I did talk about our strategies. Since 2007, we have a, um, a very climate oriented action in the city of Athens. We did the resilience strategy and our first climate action plan. And last year, as I said, we issued uh, uh, the adapted climate action plan for a resilient and a climate neutral city for, um, for 2050. And, you know, there are a lot of mitigation goals, very ambitious mitigation goals um, for 2030. But what it really uh, comes to uh, in the reality, because um, measuring um, uh, emissions is something that it's quite technical and quite laborious. We're issuing this in a month now, we're issuing the CDP um, measurements to the platform. But adaptation goals is very, very important also. Um, for everyday life. So our main goals is to increase the 30% the green spaces and permeable surfaces in the city of Athens, and also give access to at least 70% of the population uh, in a 15 minute walk uh, uh, to go on foot to a green space with ecosystemic services from their houses. I briefly present you here the axis of our action plan, but I'm not going to go through to all of them. I'm just going to, there is a lot. That there's a lot to do with energy upgrades and building upgrades that do have some thermal comfort, um, net zero building stuff. But I do want to focus here a bit uh, on, uh, on what Claudia was talking about earlier, you know, um, the hotspots of the city. So in 2017, we did map a lot of uh, um, we, have the, we have a lot of information mapped in this uh, top diagram that shows the green spaces of the city, shows the hot uh, spots of the city, but also shows in blue, you know, what are the most uh, socially vulnerable populations of the city. And we notice that all these data coincide, you know, the places that don't have green spaces are the most, are the hottest places in, in Athens and other places that have 
um, that most vulnerable people, socially vulnerable people, live with low income. Um, and last year, we did a more detailed uh, mapping of uh, the hot temperatures in the city on a building block, uh, building block level. And this allows us to see in more detail which in every building block of the city, what is the problematic area. And uh, the, there's a lot of analysis. Probably I don't have the time to go through that, but it might be interesting at some point to, or if you have any questions, please do, do ask. Uh, but on the, on the west side of the city of Athens, you see the area of uh, Eleonas. It's a post-industrial site now. It used to be the ancient olive grove of the city of Athens, which has turned into a post-industrial site. And now we are redeveloping the city, making the green lung for the city. Uh, and a lot of our heat action goes into this area. Um, and on the right hand, you will see not only the green spaces, but also some structures which are hidden in maps. You know, it's the trees up, is the trees feature. And in the city of Athens, we do have a lot of tree avenues, about 94,000 trees in tree avenues that do cool down people. So it's very, very important to keep these features and um, create and keep on having cooler neighborhoods. Quickly, I'm going to show you some um, initiatives that were followed, that we're uh, taking up. Uh, it has to do with uh, Athens Resilient uh, uh, City Natural Capital Financing Facility, about creating three green corridors in the city of Athens, in neighborhoods of, of Athens, in Labrini Exarchia and Platos Academy, uh, that are very climate related projects and do have to do with heat, do have to do with vulnerable population, uh, and also have to do with uh, um, uh, water management. And because I, we think in the city of Athens that doing things that have to do with heat, it always affects you know, the water use, and it affects on how, when you actually uh, get um, showers and uh, um, a lot of, uh, uh, rain, have sudden rain, you know how to deal with that. And that's, uh, El Capitus Hill is one of these uh, places that um, you can get uh, a lot of uh, erosion of the soil uh, and how to actually keep the vegetation to keep it working. Uh, very quickly, am I running out of time? Okay. A little bit, if we could ask you to round up in about a minute's time, that would be good. I, I will be, okay. So, yes. The, the same we do with uh, our buildings, where we try to see them as um, as, uh, as as a whole, with the courtyards and then external spaces, trying to mitigate the heat the heat uh, problems as well. Oops, it doesn't work. Okay. Also, we're part of the EU mission climate neutral and smart cities, where you will see more um, in the future. I did talk about the Leonas area, but uh, on smaller scales, we create smaller scale parks, pocket parks, as we say. We've done the, about 10 already and we keep on going, trying to find more spaces, which is very difficult to find spaces in the city of Athens in the, uh, that are available in order to have this kind of work. Uh, and of course, we are regenerating the city, uh, the city center, with big, lush, um, uh, uh, regeneration plans. One more ambitious plan, it has to do with the Hadrian Ac Roman aqueduct um, uh, that uh, it's from uh, the, the Roman time and it leads down to the center of the city. I'm not going to get into too many details, but I can ask, uh, can uh, answer the questions. And also things that have to do with evaluating and assessing trees uh, in the city of Athens and especially in the National Garden. We've done a huge registry regarding the trees of the garden, and uh, there will be more on uh, awareness regarding people on the ecosystemic services and um, issues that we follow uh, in our plans. Um, the last thing it has to do with a research program that we do. Uh, it's uh, reach out shaping climate resilient cities that have 
has to do with creating tools for the city. You will be seeing them very soon uh, in the press and in our everyday use. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's really interesting following on from Claudia's to look at the role of technology here and seeing how apps work and how we're beginning to promote this and also seeing how this practically works in a city when we talk about more trees and that just seeing how you're mapping out certain areas. So thank you for that. Just a reminder to our audience, I can see some questions coming in. Keep those coming in on the Q&A and we will get to them after each of our speakers has spoken. Before that, though, we can turn to Italy now and we go to Marco Falcone, a, research, a researcher at the Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and Research. Marco, what examples are we seeing in Italy of adaptation in urban areas? Thank you, Kira. Uh, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Okay, can, very good. Yes. Okay, good. And uh, yeah, I will uh, I will present uh, Citizen Transition. First of all, I'm a researcher in ISPRA, the Italian uh, Institute for Environmental Protection and Research. I think I am part of the department called uh, Italian Geological Survey. And uh, yeah, the experience uh, the experience that we have in Italy. Uh, uh, is uh, uh, let's say um, on several several facets, and uh, I will present you the, the the document cities in transitions with the methodologies and indicators uh, that we have developed, uh, an evaluation for uh, Genoa and Palermo, and, uh, and then I will uh, come to the experimental urban adapt adaptation program with the green, blue, grey intervention and soft measures. I skip the conclusion, keeping them for the for the discussion that we have. Later on, and I have also a couple of questions for the previous speakers, uh, uh, Claudia and uh, Elizabeth. I'm very curious about this destination earth and this app that uh, was spoken about uh, uh, in, in Athens. But uh, first of all, let me let me introduce uh, this, uh, this document, Cities in Transition. And uh, we have developed a methodology, uh, a methodology to uh, monitor uh, the, the resiliences of the cities in, in Italy. And uh, uh, we have studied before uh, developing the, the methodology, three different uh, documents that uh, are the guide for climate resilient cities uh, de developed by University Universidad de la Navarra, indicators for resilience cities of OECD and city resilience index by Rockefeller Foundation in collaboration with ARU. So after studying all those uh, documents on resilience, uh, uh, we understood that the resilience is not just heat waves. Uh, and uh, it's more than this. And uh, so we developed a number of indicators that are, have been developed for, for uh, evaluating 21 cities in Italy, the, the uh, capitals of the regions. Okay, so uh, uh, the criteria to develop, because those three, three documents, uh, we, we had some, something like 30, 35 indicators. We, we, cho we choose nine indicators on the basis of uh, significant for the specific topic, uh, availability and geographical coverage of, uh, for the 21 municipalities, because if we don't have coverage for that parameters, it's useless, of course. And the availability of temporal coverage for a minimum of, uh, sorry, for a minimum of uh, three to five years and consistency of, uh, with the topics to the municipal competence and regulatory scope. So uh, uh, to go to, to the concrete part, here you can find the indicators we, we have developed. So there are five macro themes, soil and land, water, health, green infrastructure, and social demogra demographic, uh, social dem demographic structure. And um, the indicators are, are here represented. They are impermeable surfaces on non-consumed soil, impermeable surfaces on reversible consumed soil, total water losses, uh, heat waves alert, uh, changes in excess uh, heat wave uh, and the mortality, green infrastructure in, in, in the vegetated surface, uh, surface area over urbanized surface area. It's something that we have seen also with Elizabeth in the last, uh, last slides. And uh, the social demographic structure with the, the uh, parameters that are the, 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 when the, the population have a structure with uh, people aged less than five years old or population that uh, have an age uh, higher than. Uh, 65 years old. Uh, you see here the reason for uh, for the choice and the data time interval that we have uh, we have considered, uh, as well as the unit uh, that we have used for for get grabbing those uh, go, those uh, um, uh, information from our cities. 
I will present two cities. Uh, one is uh, Genoa, and then the second is uh, Palermo. Both are on the Tyrrhenian Sea. One is in north northwest of Italy, Genoa. And uh, in Genoa, we have a, uh, uh, in, the, in the time frame that we have analyzed, we have a decrease of impermeable surface on, on non-consumed soil. But uh, we have also some, some new impermeable surface on, on reversible consumed soil, for instance, building sites that show an increasing trend. So we have to speak about trends on things. We cannot change everything or rebuild the cities uh, in some way, no? because uh, we have a, 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 an history of uh, 3,000 3, years. So it's impossible to, to let's say, to, uh, we have to do uh, whatever we can. No? We, we should uh, achieve resilient cities. Uh, then, of course, uh, the, regarding the landslide hazard is something that is very, very sensitive in Italy. We had uh, uh, around 90% uh, um, uh, uh, of um, uh, ninety percent of the territory of Genoa is uh, characterized by landslide hazard. It's a lot, and five percent of flood hazard. In uh, uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, the Genoa was affected by per, uh, severe flooding uh, and with damage uh, damage uh, related also with the small landslides, small landslides, and also some. Sea storms give some damage to the to the to the uh, to the dock. Uh, going to the other parameters, the number of heat wave uh, alert uh, days decreases uh, over the five years period, uh, fifteen to thirteen, uh, and uh, there is a stagnation situation also recorded for the green infrastructure with the values of percentage of vegetated areas bo both publicly and privately owned over the urbanized area around 50%. I take the opportunity of this, uh, of this slide to show uh, how we, let's say this graph, no? So you can see the nine, the nine parameters that we have considered and in the inner circle, you see uh, uh, different arrows, up arrow and down arrow means that uh, the indicators will go up or down as well as uh, the, the color uh, um, that is red when uh, there is a negative trend and uh, uh, green when there is a positive trend. So in this way, we have a picture on the decade of the, the city. So we, have, we can evaluate 21, at least at the moment, uh, uh, Italian cities according to their resilience. Now let's pass to Palermo, the next uh, the, 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 the city in Sicily. Many of you know it, and it's uh, on the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea. Um, so it's more similar to uh, to Athens for uh, for let's say for latitude at least, no. And uh, is uh, in Palermo we see that is critical from the po point of view of resilience, especially for the percentage of water losses. Water is a let's say uh, water losses are something that we have to 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 deal with. No, we we have a uh, let's say a lot of pipelines that are from. Uh, uh, from the Second World War, so they have, we have a lot of losses. Water will be the oil of uh, the next century. So we have to think also of water as a non-renewable renewable source. Also, if we have, uh, uh, let's say, th th those big, uh, big uh, uh, meteorological events uh, we have seen uh, with uh, Claudia that could affect uh, heavily also uh, uh, our cities. Then uh, going to other indicators, uh, mm, 18 hectares of soil were sealed in uh, between in the five years and uh, two particularly significant storm events occurred in Palermo in 2019 and 2020 and uh, that uh, highlighted the fragility to heavy rainfall. Heavy rainfall is also the other side of uh, uh, heat waves. No? So we have to think that uh, uh, things that uh, events that you, you can think just in, uh, in, the, in the tropical areas could happen also in Palermo that is uh, has ever been a sunny, sunny uh, uh, city. So it's, uh, it's uh, critical because we have also some casualties for that. And uh, it's important to protect uh, uh, our population. Uh, other parameters, uh, green, green, um, green infrastructure uh, is uh, substantially uh, the same. And also the heat in heat wave alert days uh, were uh, a lot more because we had 20% uh, more in uh, 2017 in respect to 2015 and plus 13% in uh, uh, compared to 2015. So heat waves are increasing in Palermo. This is uh, data that we have. No? So it's a confirmation of what Claudia said in the first presentation. So uh, 
we have this this for just 21 cities think about it for countries uh, in, in Europe, or at least a number, a selection of countries, a selection of cities in Europe, no? Could have a, a full picture that could be, let's say, the demonstration of the models that we have seen with cloud. The second part of my presentation, I will speak about the experimental urban adaptation program. Ah, sorry, I forgot to say that uh, the, the documents, this document will, uh, is uh, under publication in English in days, uh, in the uh, in the um, in the website of uh, uh, ISPRA, so I will give uh, uh, the the organizers uh, the <coughs> the the links when it will be available to download. So you can you can follow more more information, more in details, also for other other uh, for other cities. Thank you, Marco. We're beginning to run out of time, so if you could sure. go very quickly through the second. Very point, quickly. A Thank of you. Minutes, and then we Thank can... you, Kira. Thank you for the reminder. So uh, we I will uh, use those two minutes to sp uh, to sp uh, explain the experimental urban urban adaptation program. The uh, the Italian government uh, started to to put uh, uh, let's say a fund of eight eighty millions of euro in two years for uh, for uh, several several uh, uh, works, and I will briefly. Uh, introduce those works. Uh, we, we speak about green blue intervention, uh, gray intervention, and soft measures. So I will go uh, to green intervention that are uh, comprehensive creation of green spaces in urban areas or peri urban forestation to mitigate the effects of climate change, use of reflective low heat absorbing materials for horizontal and vertical uses, implementation of climate controlling building measures, green roofs. Uh, uh, walls, vertical forest, tree shedding barriers. So these are green interventions. And uh, the, uh, the budget, 50% of the total budget is for green intervention. Blue intervention, uh, we, we speak about the creation of rainwater harvesting uh, system. So we speak of blue means water, no? Uh, creation of rainwater harvesting system with purification and storage. And intervention aimed at recycling and reuse of purified wastewater. Wastewater is a resource. You have to think it's not a waste. Wastewater is a resource that we have to use uh, and uh, try to, maybe not for potable use, it could be for other use. Cannot leave the, 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 leave the, the wastewater go, go outside without, uh, without tr trying to reuse them. Uh, Gray intervention counts for 30% of the total budget. Uh, we, we mean for, uh, for green intervention, creation, uh, extension, uh, and reconstruction in urban areas or pedestrian areas, and uh, restoration of soil permeability. Soil sealing is a problem. Was also one of the, uh, was quoted also by the, the soil policy, the European soil policy, uh, as one of the, uh, of the uh, main threats to soil. No? So soil sealing is a, is a problem for several things, not only it waves, but uh, I mean also for, uh, let's say, uh, um, running, running of the water running the, uh, over the surfaces. In, in Rome, we have uh, some roads that becomes like, uh, uh, like uh, rivers no? in, uh, when, when we have an heavy rainfall. Or other, in, other, uh, in, the second, in the second picture, you see uh, sustainable urban drainage with also smooth, uh, smooth uh, operation, as, as you can see from the picture. That's all from my side. I hope uh, uh, it would be interesting. Uh, ready for uh, the next part of the uh, the panel for uh, for question answer and whatever. Thank you very much. Floor to you, Kira. Thank you. I think particularly highlighting that water will be the oil of the next century is a major thing here. It's it's only really that now that we're beginning to talk about it, and it's interesting that you're talking about the greening of infrastructure and also that need to capture as much water as possible. Well, finally, let's turn to France and Felix Blanc. He's project manager for the ecological transition department at the city of Marseille. So Felix, what is Marseille doing to build a resilient city? Yes, uh, hello everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say that, um, like Athens, we are part of the uh, Climate Neutral and Smart Cities program by the EU Commission, and we have just uh, uh, we have just um, uh, finished our uh, climate city uh, contract. Uh, at least uh, the first part, we are waiting for uh, feedback from the EU Commission. Uh, and in this, uh, there is uh, of course it's. Uh, a lot of uh, on transport, uh, renovation, uh, refurbishing uh, housing, and um, of course uh, we have also um, elements on uh, adaptation. Even if we have work more on the question on reducing emissions, but the question is how to combine both uh, adaptation, 
uh, and uh, and uh, mitigation. So um, first of all, we have we have uh, released uh, a study. Uh, it's for it's a four year uh, study on the city uh, uh, city uh, center of Marseille. It's called City Earth Resilience uh, Marseille. I just share with you. Um, it's this is the the city center, and I will uh, send the link. Uh, in the Q and A, I try. I don't know if it works, but I, I will. I would like to just send the link to you uh, because um, we have it's uh, it's published. It's online. We have sixty pages of study uh, with forecast for the two thousand fifty. And for instance, in the city center, we expect to have on uh, soil temperature at ninety degrees because uh, it's it's what has been has been studied. And in this, uh, this is a diagnosis of the city center that is similar to um, Napoli or other uh, Mediterranean cities. It's uh, a lot of uh, uh, small streets, uh, especially you can see it's the historical parts, the Greek part here, uh, uh, which is near the, 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 the port, uh, with a lot of uh, very tiny streets. But uh, during the 19th century, during the expansion of the city, the industrial era, uh, there was this uh, large uh, streets, and the, the study uh, looked at the circulation of winds and uh, in in streets and, and also the sun. And you have, uh, for instance, uh, you have um, this kind of um, this kind of simulation on how the the streets, the wind is circulating in streets depending on various uh, uh, parameters. It was very important for military reasons to. Uh, um, as in Paris, uh, to to have large cities because it was a time of a prize in, in in all Europe in mid nineteenth century. But uh, regarding the question of wind and uh, and uh, or today is not more uh, really adapted to to what we need. And so the question is how to to modify the circulation of winds uh, in the city center. So it's 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 a diagnosis. There is a lot of other things on the on the water the the. the the water retention uh, is a role of ecosystem in the city center. Uh, but I, I just would like to, uh, first before to, to, to present you my plans. Uh, the city of Marseille uh, was um, I have to say that uh, the city the, the city of Marseille um, it was first of all the expansion was in the 19th century and then in the 20th century. Uh, first of all, it was in the, the historical city center, is what I, sh I show you right now. But after you have an expansion uh, with the industrial ports, uh, and uh, during the, the 1950 and the, um, after the Second World War, you have uh, an extension, another extension, with uh, more than 125,000. Uh, housing units, collective units uh, built. Uh, so we have three uh, three different characteristics. You have the city center, um, you have the industrial era, and you have the now the post-colonial, let's say, uh, uh, housing uh, collective housing. So I would like now to show to show you the 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 plan. Uh, Okay. I just have to stay on the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see the um, this is the yeah, we can. Yeah, this is our strategic plan for 2030, and it's to use uh, the, the idea is to uh, restore uh, nature in the whole city. We have uh, uh, only uh, 4.6 square meter per inhabitant in uh, green, uh, so it's very very low. Uh, it should be at least 12, uh, and even more now. Uh, so it's very uh, very low, and we are you 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 can see here. The, the strategy, uh, as I say, you, you have the city center uh, uh, in the uh, near the ports, and then the city is very uh, uh, the, the extensions is twice the size of Paris, uh, and you have uh, mountains everywhere. 
But one of the main objectives, uh, the first objective is to preserve uh, uh, and uh, plan uh, green infrastructure and uh, to have uh, continuity. Uh, for instance, you have the three river that you can see. And during the industrial era, these river were used for, uh, for industry. Uh, and so it's really polluted, the soil are polluted, and it's also really urbanized. And we have to uh, unveil uh, the, the nature, it's, so to say. It's not uh, like uh, in the Renaissance, but in to say that it's mathematical, but it's, it's that it's, it's alive and it's, it's, it's there and it's behind uh, a concrete. And the idea is that we have three main, uh, these three main uh, uh, rivers to, to, to have continuity. Uh, and to make sure that uh, the, 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 all the, the, the subsystem, water system, are also uh, uh, restored. Uh, it's, it's very important and it's, it's one of the, the main objectives and to, to have also the water not pouring to the city because all the, nowadays in Marseille, uh, the, the water system, uh, the, the wastewater system, uh, and the, it's go to the sea uh, every time there is uh, rain. And so the idea is to to try to, to try to have the, all the rainwater to to be uh, stored uh, to be uh, stored in, in in the soil. Uh, so this is the, the first uh, the, the first intervention. Uh, you can see also that uh, we have um, we have several uh, parks uh, that we have already, but we want to um, to have. Kind of refuge, uh, climate. Uh, we call it call it a climate refuge for inhabitants. That um, this year we we just uh, voted for a, a, a sixty million plan for planting uh, more than three hundred thousand trees in uh, city parks and to densify uh, these parks to to uh, prepare regeneration. And it's also the idea that to have in each neighborhood to have at least uh, one uh, uh, big park uh, in case of uh, uh, extreme heat uh, to, to have uh, people to refresh uh, at least once a day in this parks. Uh, this is very important. We have a lot of parks in Marseille already. We will create more. But the idea is to, uh, to, to preserve what we have and, and to densify it. Densify, densify it. And we have also uh, a tree nurseries uh, that is very important for this uh, plan uh, and that uh, will be uh, um, developed in the, in the next few years. So uh, the idea is also to, to, uh, to for the public square to, to have, uh, of course, uh, more uh, trees and to, um, and to have continuity, uh, green, we call it green lines. Uh, brown lines also at the, with the root system. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, very important for the development of trees. Uh, and so for last, uh, the last, last two points, uh, it's that we have, for instance, a very important points. I didn't develop it for the, in the historical part, but you can you see this canal here, uh, Marseille, the historical center during more than during 2000 years, even uh, 2500 years, uh, it was it relied on uh, storing water, uh, like from the Roman, uh, as uh, many uh, like you used a uh, lot of basins and and uh, to to store water, uh, and we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, gardens, uh, a lot of place in the city center that are not known already that we would like to. Restore because uh, in the mean, uh, mean, when the, the expansion of the city in the, in the industrial era uh, was possible because of the construction of this canal, which goes to the Durance, which is the big river coming from the Alps. It was a Napoleonic uh, uh, work and it was a huge, huge, huge uh, investment at that time. And without, without it, it, it would have been impossible for the Marseille to develop. Impossible at that time. It, it, it was three three two hundred thousand inhabitants, and it was it it, it was uh, thanks to that it's now fast uh, uh, almost uh, one million inhabitants, and this is the canal you can see here. It arrived in the city center at the highest point in the city center, and then there is a system of of several other canals. You can not see them here, but to to distribute the water in the city. 
And this, uh, when you look at at, uh, at the um, ice melting in the mountains and the perspective in the mountains, it can be that in a couple of uh, decades, even sooner, and unfortunately sooner than expected, uh, the the water in summer will will uh, we will lack water in summer as when we, we were in the former uh, city wall that you can see uh, in the middle here uh, when the city was. Uh, of course, smaller. And there was only one liter per inhabitant at the beginning of the 19th century, one, one liter of water per inhabitant per day. You can imagine the difference <laughs> with now. And, uh, and the question is how to prepare for, uh, to prepare in terms of historical research on all uh, the facilities we have in water retention, uh, like in architecture, uh, to, to reduce, of course, the the, the the waste of water in the sea because we have uh, most of those rain uh, rainwater as I said goes into the sea and to uh, of course to to use um, uh, waterproofing to to uh, uh, to have the water in the soil and to preserve it this is uh, I think uh, a vital uh, question uh, for for Marseille not only for Marseille Barcelona is in a in the, in the worst situation Barcelona was in a water crisis several times. And Marseille, uh, there was boats uh, uh, from Marseille tanks, uh, water tanks that were sent to uh, to to Barcelona with like a, if I remember well, it was two hundred thousand uh, uh, tons of water. So you can imagine at some point that Marseille, because of the Alps and because of this facility, this canal can, can be a course uh, of uh, can help uh, all the cities, uh, other cities in, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. But I think the best help we can have is what I've presented uh, before. Uh, and thank you for this uh, all these ideas uh, on how to, to 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 keep the water within the soil and for the trees and for us for the for for all the uh, living uh, beings. So and the last point I will conclude with this is the citizen engagement. Um, you see, there is a lot uh, about uh, sensibilization, uh, outreach, and how to educate people on preserving ecosystem, biodiversity, learning how the biodiversity can be used uh, to um, to have effects on 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 uh, uh, on the the comfort uh, of life, uh, daily life. Uh, circulation of water is very important. For instance, we have a huge park that is dedicated to the celebration of the, the, the arrival of this canal in Marseille, it's called the Palais Longchamp. And we have just restored a, 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 water, a water place for the, for the children uh, so they can play in the park with, uh, uh, with water circulating within the park. And this is the most important thing that to have the children uh, with a system in schools, in parks, everywhere in public squares, uh, that can because it's good for the soil to have the water circulation. This is well known. Uh, it's much better than uh, uh, other kind of circulations, uh, and it's also um, uh, very important for them to educate on how, how to not to waste water. Uh, and this is a plan we have a sobriety, uh, sobriety uh, to reduce a resource consumption uh, that we have adopted this year. To reduce, of course, electricity and gas, but also, uh, but uh, also uh, uh, water. Water is uh, because we have a lot of leaks within uh, our administration. Water leaks, and we have, uh, we have, we want to be exemplary uh, on this. So, um, so if you want to see the, the whole study, it's in French, but it's uh, there is a lot of uh, scheme. Uh, I have sent it uh, to you. I think it's been shared. And um, this is uh, the study is a scientific study, and we have worked with a uh, with uh, with a scientific, scientific researcher on this uh, with a lot of uh, measures. And this is the plan. It's the first time that we I present the, the plan uh, outside of uh, of Marseille. So uh, it's only the the green infrastructure plans, uh, but uh, because I think green infrastructure can help us uh, reduce the use of uh, climatization. Uh, and uh, of uh, uh, energy consumption that is, of course, uh, highly problematic right now. Uh, of, we have other plans in terms of innovation. For instance, we, we want to use a uh, 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 cooling system with the water. We have already two uh, districts that use seawater to cool uh, buildings. Uh, on the it's on the on the, system, uh, the port uh, here. We have two uh, two networks already. 
and they are they are prototypes and we would like to extend them because i'm i'm even if what nature can do a lot uh i i think it's important for the city of marseille to have a, a kind of uh emergency system uh emergency system i call it uh, uh the the blue lung of marseille if you want it's to have the city the we have the the water uh the water uh, uh temperature pressure uh, like uh, 18 degrees and you can use it uh, to cool the system to use less energy it's 80 percent uh, renewable energies uh, and it's very okay. promising it's, of, it's a lot of investments and not not all kind of uh, buildings can have this for instance in the city center it will be more renovation ventilation uh, using a passive housing uh, this kind of stuff but in the all these waves uh, of collective housing from the uh, 50s 60s 70s for them we have already networks and we can use the uh, the seawater to cool them and as i say to for them to have access to see to the sea even if they are far away uh, thank you thank you Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Felix. I mean, very interesting. I'm glad you brought up education there because I think that is a core part of this. If we want to raise new generations knowing how to adapt and, and mitigate climate change, uh, just to raise some points that everyone who has talked about the importance of water, either in cooling or just in how cities function and looking at uh, the fact that these cities have been around for a very, very long time and suddenly we're having to use them in a very different way. I know you mentioned that, Felix, and I'm sure that's a thing for Athens as well. And then we're looking more into the future with all of the technology that can maybe start helping us make those changes. And I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing about these apps and, and what Claudia mentioned as well. Well, given everyone had such interesting things to say, and I think everyone is able to learn from each other, I would like to bring in each of our panelists to maybe comment on what everyone else has said. Claudia, maybe let's start with you. Is there anything particular that stood out for you, given your perspective on this? Yes. Um, thank you, Kira. Well, I would like to, you know, also thank all the other panelists, too, because I think we really got a very great overview of what's going on and what's been done. And one of the things that um, hit me the most, uh, and it was mentioned uh, by Elizabeth, was the app, you know, that could um, point out uh, where uh, cool spots are in the, in the city. And I think that the reason why I'm thinking about that is that I think so far we give for granted the way we be talking about those living in these cities. But I think we also don't have to forget that these are also very touristic places. Okay, so we have plenty of tourists going to Athens, to Marseille, and I also think about myself. I find myself in a city that I don't know much about, but maybe it's very hot and I might be in need of find a park or a place where to cool down. So I think that could be interesting also from a touristic point of view. Thank you, Elizabeth. Maybe let's move to you next. Was there anything that you heard today which you think might be useful in Athens? Um, I think all, all presentations were excellent. Uh, I think everybody gave their perspective and their um, uh, and their solutions, let's say, in uh, issues regarding the heat. You know, the scientific com community gave a lot of input on that. Uh, but also, you know, also what... Um, uh, uh, Especially, you know, I was really impressed with the green infrastructure plan of uh, Marseille, and um, we are very honored to see the first viewing of it here. So, um, uh, it's very, very important to be able to um, to actually present and follow up a green infrastructure plan as a basic master plan for a city. And you know, all these strategies that every city has. Uh, at the end of the day, it should be a climate um, uh, master plan uh, that relates to the risks of uh, of, of uh, heat or flooding. And green infrastructure plays their most important role. It's a systemic approach to to the city, and uh, it should include um, water, soil. Uh, vegetation, as well as social needs and uh, 
the social spaces as uses of the city. So it's very important that if, if a green infrastructure plan, it seems like you've done it from the way you did it, we've seen it, um, incorporates and resolves the issue to make bring nature into the city and also resolve these issues that uh, you are addressing as climate hazards. I think I was really happy to see that. Uh, by the way, I sent you in the chat a video regarding the application. Maybe you want to share it with the group. I'm sure someone, who's, yeah. someone behind the scenes, I'm sure, will be able to do that. I'll ask someone to share that to the Q&A maybe now. Felix, is there anything that you've heard today which you think could be put into place in Marseille? Uh, yes, I think uh, what I've seen from Athens and um, in Athens, this uh, shared public space, uh, this is, I think, uh, very, uh, very important. I was in Athens uh, uh, in, in April uh, and I have seen uh, the progress because the last time was like, I think, 15 years ago. So <laughs> it was last time was in summer and this time was in uh, spring. So, of course, uh, it's a bit different, but uh, I, I really liked the how the citizens take care of the of the green infrastructure and they, they are they take parts to the directly in, in Marseille currently it's much more spontaneous and you have what the city plan to do try to do and you have spontaneous because it's taking too it's too slow the citizens uh, in, it's, it's a bit uh wide or I mean in a way it's uh, it's not uh, really organized, and the the, the plants uh, suffer at the end. So what I like in in, in Greece and what I've seen from uh, my, with my eyes uh, in, in in Athens is that you have this uh, cooperation uh, between the city and and the inhabitants. From my perspective, and I would like to have this in Marseille one day. Excellent, Marco. Does anything stand out for you regarding all the discussions we've had? Sorry, Kira, did you ask me? Yes, it's okay, what stood sorry. out for you. <laughs> yeah, I miss, uh, it was me just missing. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say a very, very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I'm thinking with uh, the, the, the instrument uh, shown by Cloud, the, this digital destination earth uh, could be absolutely useful for uh, for master plan or future future cities uh, to avoid uh, additional uh, additional load to, 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 to the cities uh, and uh, eventually see how, uh, um, how would be the scenario in in uh, in future in uh, in fifty or ten uh, in fifty or one hundred years, uh, and um, yeah, I have to say that's very very interesting the the idea of an app uh, in Athens uh, the, the with the cooling spaces. Uh, I would like to to ask uh, uh, also Elizabeth which uh, we, which are the information that are, that are inside this app and how many downloads maybe to understand. Uh, if uh, you have, uh, let's say, a good uh, a good result in 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 that, we are aware that people with more than sixty five years old are not so confident with the, with the, uh, with the new new uh, uh, telephones. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's important to know if uh, there is an impact. And then uh, um, regarding uh, regarding Felix, and I'm, I'm uh, really fascinated by this Jarrett River that uh, ends, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, in the middle of the city and with channels and uh, uh, yeah, it's very, very important to understand that, <clears throat> that also water uh, is managed properly. This is for the first spot, Kira, then uh, I have uh, additional comments for the second round. I, I love it when people help me out with my job when I'm a moderator. Elizabeth, maybe let's go to you with those questions. So how is the app performing and how does it work maybe for people who are el elderly or they may not have a phone? Uh, well, people who don't have a phone um, cannot have access to the app, so that's very clear. Uh, so, uh, and I think it's um, it's it's a it's a big it's a great tool for visitors for the city of Athens. This application we just heard that it's gonna be announced in the uh, it, it it will probably be on the airport of the city of Athens for people to download for visitors to come and kind of have access to it. So it's 
So it's very important from our point of view to upload the correct information for the people to view. One of the last additions that um, uh, we ask to be incorporated is the street trees of the city of Athens, which also gives a dimension of the shaded trees and shaded uh, uh, streets uh, of the city and the walks that uh, they can take. Um, I've sent you, if you want to uh, put it now, maybe it's the time to, to play the video. I don't know who, who can do that, or I can do that. I don't know. I should share a screen. But I have problems sharing screens, so I'm I think we will it. leave the video for people as homework <laughs> after this. Okay, okay. As anticipation for people once they finish <laughs> this. Um, on the app as well, what type of information are you giving? We saw the indicators that Marco said earlier. Are they along the same lines? Can you repeat? I'm sorry, I didn't get this. What type of information is shared in the app? Um, <clears throat> We give, uh, imagine this is like a Google uh, application. It's, it's, it's like a Google Maps kind of approach, but it does point out the, the green infrastructure much more strongly than it, we used to. It puts in the uh, cooling centers where, it, where we have seven municipal districts in the city of Athens. And uh, in each municipal district, we have a shelter, a climate shelter. Uh, that is run by the municipality during the heat waves. So we have the hours that it runs from eight o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night. There is a guidance regarding the heat waves and what people should be doing there. Uh, we inform them about the air quality uh, in order to move on, to uh, uh, move around the city. And there is, there will be this sign about uh, the alert of the heat wave. You know, if it's a zero, one, two, three uh, category heat wave, uh, with a link to the meteo. Uh, this is under. This is something that we are doing right now. Uh, and um, we also have the, uh, the, the. We give the opportunity to follow the shortest route, the coolest route. Uh, with the and the route with the more um, cool places, let's say it would be uh, fountains, it could be uh, water taps, what a water fountain that people can drink. So it's a it's an ongoing process. We as we go and we populate our GIS services and the elements of the city, we also populate this application and um, uh, we put things into the dashboard. Excellent. And we have a question from Alexander Strage. Uh, maybe let's go to you, Felix, on this, because I know you mentioned education. Are there any initiatives, no matter in which of the presented cities, that have a strong emphasis on public partic participation or engagement? So actions that are co-constructed with citizens or that require citizens to change certain behaviours? Is there anything like that that's going on in Marseille? Uh, yes, we we um, have been involved uh, in a, a qualitative uh, survey for the re uh, regeneration of parks, and the we have done three surveys so far. Uh, so citizens, uh, we asked them to choose between a, a set of equipments uh, and interventions, and we compare them. It's called. Uh, uh, um, and uh, it's, it's comparative analysis of, of preference uh, and, and uh, conjoint, conjoint analysis. Uh, this is technical terms. And it shows all the preference and what is the most important for the citizens. And it put them in the situation of having to choose priorities uh, between equipments with a limited budget, which is very interesting. Um, we have been deploying this for the past year and we have not, we have implemented for instance this uh, water water place in the Parc Longchamp, which is the most emblematic park in Marseille, um, thanks to this survey because it was a number one proposition by uh, by the inhabitants to have this uh, the restoration of this uh, water place. It's, it's a success. Uh, so this is one of the most important. The second one was I mentioned the streets and uh, we have a kind of uh, charter of cooperation to green the the, the streets in the city center, but it's similar to, to what I've been said. 
Marco, how much citizen participation do you see in Italy when it comes to these types of things? Well, uh, <clears throat> we have to say that the, in Italy, uh, let's say the, the problem of, uh, of climate change um, is not on the top of the, of the agenda at the moment. Uh, there is a movement, you know, better than me, movement of uh, Fridays for Future or as well as uh, uh, national or international NGOs that are, uh, let's say, uh, putting uh, these uh, into uh, into protests uh, or uh, let's say uh, claiming that uh, they they should be listened to their their claims, no. And um, anyway, uh, um, a growing perception that we have to do something for the future for our uh, um, our children is uh, is uh, is raising. And uh, I would say also that. Uh, uh, one one in crucial thing is to monitor the vulnerability of our cities because uh, yes, yeah, so if we don't have a, me a methodology to uh, to uh, monitor, we have we don't have the possibility to to identify the weakest point of the cities. Uh, so let's say uh, we I have explained what what we we are monitoring: water loss, uh, soil loss, uh, green infrastructure, heat waves, uh, and we have to think of start starting reversing the trends. Not just having no impact, but starting to reverse in the trends and putting, uh, let's say, uh, methodologies, uh, uh, civil works, uh, a number of things we can do uh, to start reversing the trends and monitor the trends that are, should be reversing. Otherwise, we have to change our policies. No, so this is uh, um, this is the idea behind the. Thank you to the to the to the uh, director that uh, posted in uh, the in the chat the the PDF of the, our report. Uh, unfortunately, still in Italian. But we have to uh, to have a methodology to see also if our policies are good or not, or if we have, if we have to do something more. Claudia, how much public participation do you see, and how much communication do you find that you have to do, or is it very much you engaging with maybe the politicians and the civil servants? Sure, uh, we do. Uh, we do a lot of uh, of communication uh, about this, but then uh, let's say uh, what we see that is not uh, enough cooperation for the goal. It is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one of the SDGs, SDGs number seventeen, as you know, in the, of the, the United Nations. We need. Uh, we have seen beautiful examples of Marcel and Athens. Uh, uh, we see in um, in other countries that uh, uh, municipalities, provinces, and regions doesn't do the same. Let us work together for 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 this goal. So I think it's important, uh, uh, crucial that uh, uh, all those uh, uh, the, those uh, um, institutions, uh, uh, comprising also the European Union, I would say not just municipal, from municipalities to European Union, would go towards more resilient cities. It's something Thanks. that is. Uh, not stop stoppable right now. At the moment, we are speaking about 1.5 uh, uh, grades more in in 2050. Uh, not all countries have signed the agreement, so we have to prepare our cities for 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 the worst worst situations. Claudia, how do you see this issue coming up, particularly with pu um, public participation? So, um, well, as you know, ECMWF, our role, of course, is to produce uh, weather forecast and uh, we, of course, uh, uh, disseminate them to our member states. And you could see from the map, you know, I sent you before that there are many uh, European nations. So, of course, our um, forecasts are taken from there by the uh, National Weather Service that then, of course, it can, uh, you know, liaise with uh, the, the politicians and the policymakers um, <clears throat> to, of course, um, uh, take actions based on those. Um, but of course, also we are um, we uh, yeah we participate in many, for example, um, Horizon 2020 projects, so research projects. Um, they are funded by uh, the European Commission by the EU, and in these we try to gap, you know, to fill the gap between uh, uh, what we do as a scientist, okay, and uh, the actions that need to be taken. And uh, in my case, for example, I've been working a lot on these uh, climate, weather, and health interface. So in some of the project, for example, we uh, we collaborated directly with the health professionals, with the medical doctors, okay, to understand when 
weather forecasts can give us an information that then can translate in some health impacts. For example, more admissions in hospitals or for example, kids getting asthma, okay? So it's, this is this very interesting point of not just having weather forecast per se, okay? But having a human-centered, you know, weather, weather forecast, okay? And uh, if we can think of parallel also in climate projections, so 50, 100 years, right? Not just the climate data, but how those climate data can uh, help us in what, you know, Marco, Felis and Elizabeth were saying in making our cities more, more habitable. So really helping cities prepare, not just a forecast for weather, but forecast for what the weather impacts, I guess, are going to be. Felix, we had a question from Jose Azevedo um, about what the role of private cars is and whether, you know, as part of adaptation, we need to reduce public car use, uh, private car use, sorry. So, I mean, we often see it where you have maybe car parks along the side of the road, which could be trees. Is that something what you're looking into for Marseille? Sorry. Yes, um, our emissions, um, I mean, direct emissions, uh, it's more than 50% that, that are cars, transportation, logistic, uh, cruise ships. So we, of course, it's the most challenging issue. Uh, and uh, we, uh, for instance, we we um, we have this uh, bicycle slides, but we um we have a, a, a plan for 130 kilometers, but we have another plan which is much more ambitious, which is 700 kilometers, which is not yet uh, agreed between uh, let's say political uh, stake uh, stakes, and um, because uh, seven uh, 700 kilometers is half of the streets of Marseille uh, with. Uh, bicycle lines, which is not that difficult, uh, but there is a lot of challenge in the more in the, the behavior and the habits and the culture. Uh, this is the most difficult things in Marseille. Of course, the infrastructure, but it's not only that, it's, it's, it's the, the, the way people uh, see um, uh, like uh, bicycles and walking. It's a huge city. Uh, and, uh, so we have um, so we have we have many ideas and plans, and we have uh, we have our French president was present in Marseille for announcing a huge investment in public transport. You may have noticed. Uh, so uh, now we wait for implementation of uh, tramways and uh, trains, uh, stations, train station commuting. Uh, the, the problem is a model uh, model shift between this is very low in logistic. And in uh, also in, in in for transportation transport of persons. Just one figure. Uh, Marseille is also a metropolis with uh, ninety two uh, communes, and ninety five percent of the daily transport for economic reasons, mostly but not only, it's by car. So uh, we have a huge huge uh, gap. One other possibility, of course, that we uh, encourage is. Uh, uh, is the car sharing, uh, and to to see all means of transport as uh, commons, it will be a very good approach. Uh, we have already a fleet of uh, of uh, electric bicycles, which is very good because the Marseille also like this, and, and it's 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 a problematic. But I think I think that's to to come. Transport is very uh, very adapted for to have it at, as a, as shared resources. I think it's um, it's, the, it's the future because in terms of investment, for instance, uh, the cars, electric cars, it's impossible at, at at some point to have each individual, except maybe uh, in Norway, Norway, uh, where it's what is happening right now, but it's, it's not exactly uh, the same kind of country and economic uh, conditions as in Marseille. Uh, unless the, the visit of the president, of course, bring us uh, as, as much money as expected. Yes, that was uh, the last point. 
I think that's a really interesting point here, raising the challenge of actually getting the culture shift and the shift away from what people have used for all of their lives. Elizabeth, how do you see this happening in Athens? Do you see that you can phase out private cars or is transport a massive challenge there as well? Uh, I think for all cities, even advanced uh, northern European cities, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, I'm trying to have uh, some... Uh, I've seen the chat and there are a lot of uh, questions regarding a lot of issues. So I'll try to make a small um, uh, uh, statement for to, to get each, each one of the comments. So uh, I would like to get to the previous comment that you asked Felix regarding mobility uh, in the city. So I don't personally think that you can uh, increase uh, uh, the green spaces in the cities, and especially in, in our city, if you don't talk about mobility. Mobility is an issue that has to do with green infrastructure and it's very interrelated. And this is, uh, and I think in most European cities, not just uh, Athens, it has to do with a lot of uh, bureaucracy and a lot of approvals that do not um, uh, depend solely to the, the jurisdictions of the cities. So that's very important to have in mind. And a lot of the projects that I presented briefly, I'm, I'm really sorry that I uh, lost a little bit track of time and I didn't get to talk about them. Especially the NCFF project has to do with uh, traffic arrangement. And, uh, and a lot of the stakeholder engagement that we did for this project had to do with how people would uh, say goodbye or be a little bit far away from the car. And uh, that was, um, uh, and it, it was done during the COVID era, which was a difficult process to also achieve with workshops and stuff like that. But we did it and the feedback was uh, very good with people because we did create a livable space and we did, uh, with a proposal, create lively neighborhoods and green and healthy neighborhoods in this area. So that was, um, uh, very important and um, in, in spaces that there is not a lot of green space in available green space uh, the answer to increase the green uh, infrastructure of the city has to do uh, with mobility uh, with reducing car parking spaces reducing cars in the streets and introduce active mobility and introduce green and say that uh, areas. Um, so I've sent a, a link uh, to explain a few of the projects that we do in the city of Athens and it's on the climate action plan so if you could share that that would be good so people can have a look. Um, the application that uh, we are uh, uh, not all not all European cities have it uh, we we have it uh, I think uh, 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 Milan has it and it's also very good and adapted to their uh, strategies and stuff and uh, you go to you you can you you can't use it through your computer you have to download it on your uh, app, on your on your um, telephone so if you go to extrema uh, global uh, website uh, app uh, store whatever Called, so you can download it from there for uh, Macs and Androids and have a look. I so think there might be some more cities with that app after this presentation. Everyone <laughs> seems very interested in it. And um, there was another question for you while we're with you. So could you expand on city to city international partnerships? So besides technical corporations, what is Athens doing with its partner cities to develop regional or, or global advocacy campaigns to raise awareness of cities' heat-related challenges uh, and the need to implement this multi-level climate action that you mentioned? Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, Athens has had a boost and uh, sub great support from networks, from international networks that we've been working with regarding our climate agenda and the structured way we have moved forward. So for us, collaboration, we've been benefited a lot 
from not only just uh, on an advocacy level, which has been great, but on technical support from networks. And uh, I've sent you a map, let's say, uh, regarding the solar map of the city of Athens that we've done together with C40 network and Arab consultants. You know, that was a great technical support that we got from our, our contacts through the network and the need for renewable energy uh, 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 methods. So that, that's something that uh, we capitalize on. And uh, at the same time, through webinars and through our participations with other citizen officials, uh, at the same time, we offer our um, uh, advocacy to others. For example, now with EU mission cities, uh, where uh, we've been asked a lot to advocate the other cities on what we do, the other Greek cities on what we do to achieve the 2030 goals for climate neutrality, for example, and regarding the climate contract. Uh, so we work very horizontally and vertically at the same time. <laughs> so excellent, thank you. Maybe Marco, how much or how important is it that cities talk to each other and share information when it comes to adaptation? It would be really important, and uh, I have to say that sometimes our report is an official report with a number of. Uh, checks uh, no it's uh, we have the uh, i've uh, posted the, the in the chat the, the, the download they mostly see uh, if they uh, scoring is higher than the other city <laughs> that's not uh, the scope of our report and uh, yeah i would say you know um you have no, you have not to look to let's say to the other so we are in the middle we are not so bad you know you have to to look to the to the, to the best because uh, it's your citizen that you have to to deal with and uh, yeah, for a good policy, I would say it would be uh, absolutely important that the, the, the uh, cities and the technical part of the municipality will speak each other, keeping in mind that uh, every every <clears throat> every city has its own uh, weakness. Uh, they are, they are, they, we have very very different. Uh, we have compared for for cities Athens, Marseille, Genoa, and Palermo that are all on the sea. More, more or less are uh, Genoa and Marcel and Palermo and Athens two by two are similar some way, no? So uh, for, for latitude and uh, a number of, for, for issues. Um, yeah, it, it, if we take another city in the middle of, of Italy or France or, or Greece, probably the, the, the problems could be different. And uh, it's very, very important to identify which is the main problem of the city because uh, yeah we have also to spend well our money the money from taxpayers should be spent well not for let's say if i have uh, one percent of uh, water loss i don't invest a billion of euro for water loss i invest in water loss if i have 40 percent of losses no so and maybe the problem is uh, landslides or uh, or, or uh, i don't know uh, heat waves or something else so each city has its own weakness and we have to identify uh, it very, very well. To make an example, uh, we uh, spoke about Genoa. And in Genoa, as in Marcel, we have three rivers. Uh, three rivers that are uh, two main rivers, Bisagno and Polcevera. Polcevera is the famous river where the, the, the bridge collapsed in 2018. Maybe you have heard about it, no? But for, for uh, landslide and for uh, flooding, we had a number of deaths for Ferregiano River that is a, a small, a small modest creek that you even water. No, a small, a small creek that you didn't even water that is completely, uh, let's say, sealed. No, so it goes uh, uh, inside the city. And when, when it arrives, at a couple of trees that block the, let's say, the, the, uh, the flow, the water flow, it happens that the, 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 the city becomes the river. And uh, we had, uh, 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 let's say, a couple of mothers with their children uh, that were, uh, were into the school to take back uh, children at home that died for, for this river. And it, it's small, not river, a small creek. So we have, uh, we have to think uh, how to spend well our money. There, are, there is, uh, I wouldn't say that there is money for everything, but uh, we have to spend money well some way uh, coming to uh, not not just a small river but i would say also big river there is a, there are some problems in uh, uh, po, po river is the main river of italy 
uh, you know, uh, it's uh, uh, Italy is not so big, so big rivers, but uh, Po River is one of them. And we have a lot of problems from uh, badgers, badgers that, uh, uh, let's say, make holes into the, the river banks. And uh, from, from that, that, that holes, uh, it's a dam, we, we have a damage and the pot potential collapse of the of, of the uh, of uh, of the banks and uh, this happened, for instance, not in the Po River, but uh, in the rivers of Emilia Romagna region. You know, in May 2000, uh, this year uh, was uh, severely hit by flooding. No, so uh, let's say uh, it was uh, unbelievable that uh, the banks uh, collapsed like uh, it was a uh, uh, butter. No, so uh, we have to think also on this uh, this part and uh, the authority on Po River are are thinking how to limit the presence of badgers with, uh, let's say, pass me this, uh, this wording, sustainable killing, but that's not a bad wording, but uh, yeah, you know, badger uh, could, uh, could have, uh, let's say, in, in a strong impact also in, uh, in, the, uh, in the resilience, if not properly managed. We have that's a it. question coming in from online for you from Hossein Hamedi. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, can you elaborate more regarding making cities resilient to flooding? So you mentioned some of the issues there, but are there common things which cities can roll out to really make sure that these events don't happen in the future? Uh, and what's happening in Italy? You mentioned the blue intervention and the grey intervention on there. Yes, we have, uh, <clears throat> we have um, let's say, several plans for this. Uh, uh, for this intervention, of course, uh, maybe it's not relevant for all uh, all the countries, but uh, I know also in Netherlands there are a, a number of uh, operations uh, on uh, on river banks, for instance, in the Rhine River, and uh, we have a special special funds uh, from Europe and uh, also from uh, national taxpayers uh, to to deal with uh, with it. Uh, it's a it's a problem, however, that uh, seems to have no end because. Uh, as I've said, you, you identify maybe the, the, the 30 major river of, this, of the country. You make everything with plans, uh, with, uh, arranging with municipalities, regions and provinces, all the plans. And then it's a, a, small, a, small, a, a small creek that makes 10 to 12 deaths. So uh, you, let's say it's important uh, planning at the, at the let's say national and, uh, level, but uh, uh, I would say and the, the money that is put into into that uh, uh, operations. But uh, it's crucial that uh, municipalities, small municipalities, especially when when uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, when you have vulnerable cities, uh, would uh, identify the critical part. Because uh, if you have uh, one euro, you have to spend one euro in uh, what could give deaths or what could give, uh, let's say, risk to the population. Felix, I know you mentioned Marseille's rivers as well. What are you doing in Marseille to be able to mitigate these risks of flooding? But also you mentioned the risks of maybe not having enough water. We, uh, we have um, built... Uh... Uh, a huge um, re like recipient like uh, to, to have like when there is a rain it's it's to, to avoid uh, flooding in the city we have been the first uh, facility in, uh, to store the water and we use it uh, for heating districts or we start to using a huge potential with it uh, but we are, we need at least two, two more of them. Uh, it's uh, it's not the best answer, but it's an emergency system because our waste system and rain and rain system, our water system, are mixed in many ways. Uh, and so the other uh, is more uh, prospective, but an idea I'll try to push within the municipalities to have a disconnection of the network, so no more network for the way uh, but to have uh, as, as much as possible to uh, to redirect the water system in uh, in the um, in, uh, in the soil to uh, to keep it to store it and that that means that we have to think differently the, the all the system of uh, water as we inherited from the romance in fact of this network and uh, Canalization. It's more to redirect it at very small scale, small small networks uh, in buildings. Uh, Freiburg in Germany do, do is very well, of course, but uh, 
and yeah. and did it so well that the 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 waste system uh, underground uh, didn't work in, anymore um, because all the water was was kept uh, in the is kept in, within the building. Uh, it's 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 maybe it's not uh, the objective ultimately in say, but at least to 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 use the water and to redirect it. This is the this is very important for the to avoid the flooding. And uh, in the study, we will find a lot of, about the lines, geographic lines to find. Uh, how this the, the the water goes and where uh, we have a big problem that in the city center as you may know in Marseille we have uh, buildings that collapse and it may be that we need a geolog geologic geological studies about uh, underground waters because uh, the last studies was from the 1930s I mean last big study and we need uh, more investigation to know if the the movement uh, of of, uh, of uh, soil uh, because of uh, draining and watering because we have heavy heavy rain and heavier rain each each year uh, how it affects the the circulation of water under uh, under the buildings this is uh, very important because it's structurally it can mean at some point that uh, the whole city center which is one hundred thousand uh, building. Can be an endangered if uh so this kind of study when i said that we need to do this study of course you don't want to go there you know <laughs> to learn this kind of uh, but we're not we don't know we need more we, and science is very important here yeah, uh to make i sure think it's, it's definitely key to have the information we need know where the river runs through cities where the water is going to go and like you say where the water is under the ground as well we're beginning to run out of time for questions, but I saw one that I hope maybe Claudia, you might be able to answer. Or you may have heard of this. Uh, are there any studies into the economical impact of heat in cities? And uh, with the idea that actually if this could be calculated, it would be a great way to motivate people for to uh, tackle these issues. Uh, that's a very interesting question, but I don't have the answer to it. To be honest, I don't know whether the other panelists might have um, an idea from uh, from their cities. Let's open it up. Has anyone seen or have even anecdotal evidence as to the economic impact of heat or any other climate change impacts on their cities? From from my side, I don't have any information as Claudia. Maybe. It it could uh, it could be some reports. Uh, there are some reports also of the cost uh, of not doing uh, works. Uh, no, so it could be calculated. I'm not aware of uh, where uh, who does who did it and uh, where is the, the the documents. But I'm sure there should be something on this issue. Um, I think we Elizabeth, please go ahead. I, just very quickly, uh, there are there are reports, uh, and I could share some titles. Uh, to say to the to, to the people who attend so i'm not going to get into to more of that but there are reports expressing that and that's that's a very strong relationship between finance and heat risk excellent well again we can give more people extra reading after this <clears> event <throat> well we're beginning to run out of time so i'm going to switch and ask all of our panelists to give a quick closing statement on their um, views of what's happened and what we've discussed today. Claudia, maybe let's start with you. What are your key takeaways from our discussion today? Well, I think first of all that you, um, well, the more the merrier. So in the sense that it was nice, you know, to hear about the experiences from uh, all the different parts of Europe and especially for uh, in, from my perspective as a weather scientist, I always say, you know, when there is a heat wave coming, where there is extreme precipitation coming, they don't look at borders. It's not that they say, oh, we are uh, in Spain and then we are approaching France, you know, they stop. No, this is not how, you know, nature think, you know, so it's, it's really important, you know, to really join forces at whatever level. You know, it can be the scientific level, it can be exactly urban planning level. So, you know, the discussion we had today really reinforced this in me. It makes me really happy. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Let's, let's go to you next. What are your key takeaways from this discussion? Um, yes, uh, 
key takeaway is also that uh, science is uh, what we have in common and uh, it's common tools uh, is share understanding of the situation is to reduce fear and uh, instead of that having uh, perspective calculations trying to reduce the risk so I think it's uh, very important to have the discussion and then uh, I would like to say that it's the beginning of our new solidarities and ties uh, between cities, I mentioned uh, cruise ships. We our, our mayor uh, sent a, a call for other uh, harbors uh, in uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, and uh, there was already a gathering. And I think it's very important because cruise ships uh, and climate change, climate adaptation are just uh, are very uh, different from perspective. Let's say. And th I think we need to also to, to have this uh, approach, not only approach, but to, to build proposition. It's the diplomacy of cities to, to show that uh, the state nowadays are not sometimes not at the right pace. And maybe cities are ahead, as we, can, we have seen today with, uh, what's, uh, with Napoli and uh, Athens. Uh, so I, I think we, we have this diplomacy of city on very concrete issues like cruise ships, like water solidarity uh, can be. Uh, can be an achievement, uh, and uh, I thank, uh, of course, the Anishman Stiftung uh, for for this <laughs> for this uh, discussion. Thank you, Marco. Let's move to you next. What stood out for you? Thank you. First of all, let me thank you, uh, the uh, Eric Boller Foundation, particularly Michaelis and Benjamin, for organizing these uh, really interesting. Uh, events and to you Kira for managing uh, our time there sometimes we are talkative and uh, that's fine that somebody uh, let's say <laughs> keep us uh, on the on the on the uh, on the good path uh, yeah I, I thank you also then the, the the organization because I they uh, have shared the post on sustainaton that uh, is uh, the uh, 24 hours marathon on climate and uh, Sustainable Development Goals that will take place 18 to 19 September in Italy. So, so in a marathon of 24 hours with, the, let's say, all the all the countries from Pacific Islands to, to let's say, Europe and South America. It would be fine also if we come back with uh, Eric, uh, Eric Boll for uh, having a speech there. We have still 10 free slots for uh, for, uh, for speakers and uh, could be fine. Coming to the uh, to the uh, takeaways for uh, for people that attending uh, that are attending, I would say uh, I like three things. First is uh, uh, it's very important and crucial to monitor the vulnerability of cities. Maybe we can find also a, a, let's say a methodology common to all Europe. To, to, let's say in a way that uh, Marcel, uh, Athens, uh, uh, Genoa will speak together. We have. Uh, a common a way to evaluate and evaluate, uh, evaluate our weaknesses. Uh, uh, la, uh, second part is uh, it's crucial the co cooperation for the goal. So uh, let's say uh, all the local from local authorities, uh, uh, the municipalities, still the European Union should uh, should uh, uh, cooperate together for uh, let's say having more resilient cities and not having uh, uh, problems with the, with the raising raising temperature in the next uh, fifty. Uh, 50 years and uh, and more and then um, third and last point is uh, uh, as i've said uh, we have to we have to identify which is the problem the, the real problems of each city it's not common let's say we don't have uh, uh, we have things that are shared together common problems but uh, let's say sometimes we have uh, the biggest problem that is uh, very typical of that city and we have to identify them to to spend well the money from taxpayers that are not uh, uh, infinite, we, we have to spend them well and giving the result for, for our children. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Elizabeth, let's come to you. What are your takeaways from our discussion today? Um, it's, it's very interesting to see uh, a lot of people from various fields uh, getting united in um, one great crisis, which is the climate crisis, and especially in our area, it has to do with heat. Um, horizontal collaboration is crucial to that. Uh, institutions, local and international, is, uh, has played, in our case, a great role uh, in ad advancing this agenda for the city. And um, we are uh, also here to to assist and help and also get more advice and feedback on what we do. 
at the same time, it's important to remember that cities are uh, also ecosystems on their own. So the work, uh, you know, strategies are important and crucial in order to proceed into the future and make concrete goals. Uh, but at the same time, there are ongoing projects, there are tenders, there are um, issues that everyday life, uh, in, in our everyday working life, uh, we are dealing with. So uh, these are part of a bigger puzzle and they need to be adjusted towards the big, great plan. So uh, it's very important to remember that uh, cities are not inactive. Uh, you know, there are things are done that are done and trying to be to improve, to get better, to be better. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, at the same time, uh, try to improve the the climate situation of uh, of, of the cities. So um, these these two things run in, run in parallel and should run in parallel with the cities, because you cannot stop something that it has happening in order to make a strategy. You have to be active in both ways. Thank you. I think cities are not inactive is a perfect line to finish this conversation on. We've heard a lot about what's happening and we've heard a lot about the knowledge that can be shared between the cities. So as I mentioned earlier, this has been recorded. So if you enjoyed it so much, you want to watch it again, you are welcome to do that or you're welcome to share it online once it's been posted. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their really interesting takes. And we hope everyone has a good rest of the day and can um, watch this again if they want to. Thank you.